This is Kington Langley. It's a small village in Wiltshire in the west of England. Day to day, not an awful lot happens around here, and that's just how the locals like it. Life is quiet and peaceful. But lately, that peace has been disrupted by multiple reports of sightings of a strange and mysterious vehicle. And here is the vehicle in question, not a UFO, but a Kia, and very possibly the most important Kia ever. This is the all-new EV6, and this is fully charged. So, most important Kia ever, what, I hear you ask, is the big deal? After all, there's about a million electric SUVs at this point. Why does this one have so much resting on its sculpted haunches? Well, for one, this car has the unenviable task of following the Kia e Nero, which is categorically one of the best electric family cars we've ever seen. What's more, whereas the e Nero was something of a parts bin afterthoughty type job, this is the first Kia to use dedicated EV architecture, the eGMP platform. So really, it shouldn't just be as good as the e Nero. It should be quite a lot better. Oh, and on top of all of that, the EV6 has also been assigned with the minor task of single-handedly reinventing the Kia brand. Yeah, Kia wants to change it up. It wants to become known not just for good value and long warranties, but for design, luxury, sportiness, technology. And this is the car that's going to do that for it. It's a bit like when you watch a film for the first time and just before it begins, your mate goes, this is my favorite movie ever. It's gonna be really awkward if it's not very good. It's good news. This thing's really good to drive. I'm in sport mode right now, and in so many electric SUVs that I've driven, the sport mode button is ornamental. It just makes a few red lights flash up, and maybe the whirry noises get a bit louder, and the steering gets a bit of kind of artificial heaviness. And granted, in the EV6, I do get red lights when I go into sporty mode, but it's not just for show. Things get a bit more purposeful. This car controls its weight through corners really nicely. It kind of does feel like it wants to be driven a little bit briskly. It doesn't feel counterintuitive to the car's nature to throw it around a bit. And that has always been Kia's positioning. Kia is supposed to be Hyundai's slightly sportier sibling. And as such, this car is slightly stiffer sprung than the Ionic 5. It's got slightly more damping than the Ionic 5. We're talking subtle differences here, but they do make a difference. Ionic 5, bit of a big squashy bus, and I mean that in a good way, that's what it's intended to be. Whereas the Kia, if you're like me and you like chucking something down a twisty B road when it's a bit clear in front, this car is game. The steering's got a nice bit of weight to it and it's accurate, the driving position is good for an SUV, it's not too high up and benchy, it's all very adjustable so you can get things just how you like them. I like that noise as well. This is a fun car to drive. I think in terms of big electric family cars at this price point, the only others that I can think of that are this enjoyable to throw around would be the Polestar 2 and the Mustang Mach-E. You're not gonna mistake this thing for a Taycan, but I'm just saying, on those occasions where you find yourself on a nice bit of road and you wanna have some fun, this car is game in the way that an ID4, an Ionic 5, an Enyaq are not. And perhaps more importantly, when I'm done hooning about and I want to go back into normal mode, comfortable, serene, very easy to drive, all the things that you would hope and expect from a big electric family car, the steering becomes lighter. It's very effortless and very comfortable and quite nicely damped as well. Oh yeah, see that bump there? Very smooth. What I will say here today is this. 
in a clean, well-lit studio in front of a blank background. I thought this car looked really unusual and striking. But here, in the real world, it looks absolutely insane. It's such a crazy piece of design, especially in this lovely matte grey colour. This is, of course, the sister car to the Ionic 5, the adorable butter wouldn't melt pixel faced Ionic 5. And whereas I haven't met a single person that didn't like the way that car looked, I have a suspicion that this one is going to be a bit more Marmite, perhaps. Personally, I think it looks fantastic. But the crucial thing here is that however you feel about it, when one of these drives past, you're going to notice it and you're gonna talk about it. And I think that that's what Kia is going for. They wanna create some buzz, some controversy with this car, and it's definitely going to do that. If I do have a concern about this styling, it's how well it's going to age. This is something that a lot of you raise in the comments of our last EV6 video. Often when you come up with a really unorthodox piece of design like this, it doesn't age super well. So do let me know your thoughts about that in the comments. Is this going to go down as a design masterclass or is it gonna just look a bit frumpy in a couple of years time? And welcome to what is decisively my favorite thing about the Kia EV6, this cabin. And as I sit here looking around this interior, all I can think to myself is, by Jove, they've done it. This is what reinventing a brand looks like. Because if you were to get out of a Kia e-Nero and hop in this thing, you would never believe in a million years that these cars were made by the same brands. And I think it's the design and the quality that are really singing out to me. There are so many lovely little details in here. The seats, we've got to begin with the seats, a standout feature, unbelievably comfortable. I don't know what they've done with these headrests, but it's like a little hammock for my head. You don't get these seats on the base car from the GT line up, and I think these alone are worth stumping up a bit of extra cash for. And then it's just the little design cues. I've talked about these in the first look video, excuse me for repeating myself, but the lovely contrast stitching on the seats, this little textured pattern across the dash here, the LED lights that change in color depending on which driving mode I'm in, the beautifully designed floating center console with this kind of brushed metal effect here on the end. There are just so many little things that you can pick up on and combined they create a cabin that is to use the most cliche motoring journalist phrase of all time, a really nice place to be. And what I really appreciate about this cabin is that amid this brand reinvention, none of that Korean sensible thoughtfulness has been lost in the transition. So for example, I've still got physical, big, easy to hit buttons on the wheel where I really want them. This wireless phone charger is just perfectly positioned. It's right here where I want it instead of down in the depths of a glove box as it is with so many electric cars inexplicably. And it's the reason why underneath this gorgeous floating console, instead of unnecessary, unused space, I've got a big handy storage bin there with a million different charge ports. There are so many little thoughtful details on this car that are just going to make your life a little bit better. I'd also just like to take this opportunity to remind you that next year we're getting an EV6 GT, that's the range topper. It's going to have 576 brake horsepower and will do 0 to 60 miles per hour in three and a half seconds, which for context is only two tenths of a second slower than a Porsche Taycan Turbo. a minute to process that one. An electric Kia family car that does naught to 60 in three and a half. What? I can't wait to have a go in that thing. The amount of people that you're going to confuse at traffic lights in that car. This really is a different sort of Kia to anything we've seen before. 
Now then, let me just take a moment to talk you through all the important stats and numbers on this car. There are a lot of them. I'm going to read them off my phone because, well, this isn't the BBC, is it? Let's begin with battery size. 77.4 kilowatt usable battery in this car. That's the bigger of the two batteries available on the EV6. We actually don't get the smaller battery option in the UK because, well, no one ever buys the smaller battery option. Makes sense to me. Uh, range, well, it really depends on whether you go for all-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive, but either way, if you're careful, you really should be seeing north of 300 miles range on a charge, which is really impressive, let's be honest. The car also runs 800 volt architecture, which means super, super fast charging. We're talking 250 kilowatt charging. If you find a speedy, speedy boy, that means 10 to 80% charge in less than 18 minutes. Ooh, very fast. 4.68 meters long this car that's a little bit longer than a vw id4 it's a little bit shorter than a mustang mach -E, if that means anything to you at all and of course because we have that super super long wheelbase which is enabled by the bespoke ev architecture incredible amounts of cabin space for a car this size in fact let me demonstrate that for you right because right now i've got both front seats in my position my big huge man comfortable position and if i jump in the back now that's very impressive i mean i wouldn't say no to a tiny bit more headroom but i'm properly comfortable back here tons of legroom in the back i mean that's a proper four adult car as in you could put human adults in the back of that put them on a long drive and they wouldn't hate you at the end and that's not something that you can say for a lot of these cars rivals very impressive i'll tell you something that makes me really happy about this car the fact that that kia hyundai thoughtfulness hasn't been lost amid this brand reinvention yes they've gone all fancy and it looks like a batmobile now but it still has these little touches in here that makes you think someone's really thought how could i make this car slightly better slightly easier to live with give you some examples there's one when i indicate a little screen appears i'll show you again a little screen appears just here on my gauge cluster to show me my blind spot now fundamentally it's showing me the same thing i can look at the uh, wing mirror to see but it's a slightly different angle it's more in my line of sight it's a thoughtful little touch here's another one that i really like adjustability of the regenerative braking oh yes not exciting but that's the point it makes your life a little bit better i've got five settings for my regen brakes from off all the way up to proper proper slamming on the brake one pedal driving here's another little cute thoughtful detail that i've literally just noticed this minute underneath the floating center console i've got my big storage bin but on either side of the floating center console a little hook little hook just to hang my bag from my little shopping bag or whatever you want nice thoughtful and just one more just one more extremely lovely thoughtful detail that is just going to make your life better day to day it's the sort of thing that if you were to move on from this car and get in something else you would immediately miss this charge ports everywhere okay just from what i can see here i've got my 12 volt down there i've got what's that Oh, that's a USB-C port down there. Very nice. And then another USB-C port and then a USB-A port. And then in the sides of the seats here, just there, two more USB-Cs for the kids to charge their devices. And of course, wireless phone charging pad here. You could charge an army of mobile telephones all at once on this car. It's just a nice little touch. Just, uh, just stopped to quickly cut and roll on the cameras. And let me just show you this, look at that. Proper 360 camera. Although, what am I gonna say? I said it in the RS e-tron GT. Match the spec. I want my color with my wheels on there. That's annoying. Also worth mentioning, uh, this car is a bit of a mishmash in terms of spec. I've got some features on here like the augmented reality heads up display and the 360 camera and the meridian sound system which are actually off the gt line s the poshest one where for the most part this car is designed to match the gt line spec for anyone that cares in other words please don't email me angry things if you buy one of these based off this video and then you're like oh where's my meridian sound system i've warned you
12 inch screens here. It's nice and easy to understand. I like the layout of the menus. It all seems perfectly friendly and easy to use. One thing I do want to talk about is this panel down here. We discussed this briefly in the first look video. I just think this is a really intuitive use of space because this touch panel swaps between being my radio and my air conditioning controls depending on what I want it to be. And crucially, the things that I really want to be able to adjust on the move, i.e. my volume or my temperature, well, those are controlled by physical knobs. Easy to find, easy to use while on the move. This is what I'm saying. Clever deployment of physical buttons versus touchscreens. The stuff that you really want to be able to use while driving, it's all physical and easy to find. The stuff that's a bit more specific and you're not going to use as much, that is left to these touchscreens. And because it's switchable, it's created this really nice clean design. There's no fiddly stuff under here. Looks really tidy, really simple to use. Things I don't like about this car, come on, I can think of a couple. I can't just be all, all sunny about everything. There must be something I don't like. I, I know. This glossy piano black material that is absolutely everywhere, it's a raging fingerprint magnet. I've never much liked that. Tesla used to have this in the Model 3 and then they got rid of it because owners whinged. I just don't like seeing fingerprint magnety materials in nice cars because it stops looking nice very, very quickly. That's a pedantic one, but personally, that does bug me a little bit. Other things I don't really like? I think that wing mirror is a bit over-designed, a bit fiddly, a bit, bit much. Um, I wish it wasn't an SUV. I, I realise that's a very personal preference. SUVs all the rage these days. I seem to be the only person on planet Earth that doesn't like them very much, but frankly, this car is so nice to drive, I just wish I was a little bit lower to the ground so that I could experience it a little bit more. But other than that, that's all I got. There are so few things to complain about with this car, and that's a very Kia Hyundai quality. It's what makes them so easy to live with. You really feel like engineers have sat in here and thought, is there anything in here that would bug me if I lived with this for 10 years? They've really thought about those things, and that's why you've got a zillion charge ports, and that's why I've got a little blind spot camera that appears here, and, and that's why my f wireless phone charging pad is exactly where I want it to be, just there, not in the depths of a glove box, but right here. Now, one final number worth discussing is the price, because as you may expect, this new premium Kia commands a slightly more premium price. This car starts at £40,000. The GT line, which is what I have here, that kicks off at forty-four grand or £47,500 for the all-wheel drive version. And you kind of do want the GT line because that's the one that gets you the GT styling package and the wireless phone charger and the nice seats and the vehicle to load functionality, which allows you to plug various devices into the outside of the car, like, I don't know, a circular saw. You can literally just use a circular saw while you are filming a YouTube video. Like you could saw a piece of wood while talking to a camera. Very impressive feature, that. And then on top of that, you've got the GT Line S. That kicks off at about £48,500, and that's when you get really, really, really fancy stuff like the Meridian sound system, like heated and ventilated front seats and heated rear seats, like augmented reality heads-up display and 360-degree parking camera. A lot of stuff, a lot of very nice equipment, but £50,000 for a Kia? It's just going to take a bit of getting used to. Concluding thoughts on this car then, well, I mean, if you hadn't guessed, I really like this thing. I think it's extremely impressive and I think it has reinvented Kia. I think we will look back on this as the moment Kia became a bit nice. And my big worry for it was that amid this brand reinvention, Kia might make the mistake of forgetting where it came from, forgetting the stuff that it was always really good at, like practicality and generous standard equipment and value for money, that those things may fall by the wayside in favour of showier, more headline-grabbing stuff, like looking like the Batmobile on the outside. And the good news is that's not the case. This is still a Kia. It still does the boring but important stuff very well. It's got a big boot. It's got generous range. It's got lots of equipment as standard. It's got lots of safety features. It's got big door bins. It's, it's still a Kia just one that you want. And by the way, yes, 
I think this is still good value for money. I know that a 40K start price for a Kia is going to take a bit of getting used to, but I spent a few hours fiddling on various different configurators last night, and I'm not sure you can get much more for your money elsewhere. Take this car that I'm in right now, right? This is a all-wheel drive GT line car, starts at about 47,500. Elsewhere, that'll get you a very nicely specced ID4 or an Enyaq or a Mustang Mach-E. But none of those cars can touch this thing as far as interior quality. This cabin, for me, is more on par with the next tier up of posh electric SUVs, like the Audi e-tron and the Jaguar I-Pace, cars that cost a good 10 grand more than this one. That is what I would liken this cabin to. And actually, I think this car's closest rival in terms of what it offers as a package is the brilliant Polestar 2 because both are very interesting to look at inside and out. Both offer supreme build and material quality and both are quite fun to drive when you want them to be. But the Polestar has got nowhere near as much space as the Kia. In terms of cabin and boot space, the EV6 has the Polestar on toast. And that's what I'm saying. This is a jack of all trades. It does all things very, very well. And for the money, I'm not sure that there's an electric car so multi-talented. Bottom line, the EV6, like every electric Kia before, is a practical, well-rounded, thoughtfully designed electric car that would be a delight to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. But the fundamental difference between this and the e-Nero and the Soul is that, well, I want one of these. Like, I always respected the e-Nero, but I want one of these. And that's because it's interesting and exquisite and, well, in my opinion, quite cool. This is a Kia that you could buy with your head and your heart. So there we have it, the EV6. Do let us know what you make of this in the comments. Is this the reinvention of Kia? I think it might just be. If you have been, thank you for watching. Well, if you enjoyed that episode, you're going to love this one. And this one, too, is very relevant to the topic. And also, if you want to subscribe to Fully Charged, which is a wonderful thing to do, really helps us, costs you nothing, you just click up there. It's really simple. And if you do want to support us a little bit more, you can have a look at the Patreon link. That's up there. Thank you.